welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, remain standing since we're honoring those. Let's honor God. Let's go before God in prayer as well. So I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we just come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful on this weekend especially, Lord, that we get to come to church with freedom. Father, we get to come and freely worship you and freely seek after you. And Lord, we know that that freedom comes with a price. And so, Lord, we ask that you would set your hand upon our servicemen and women all across the world and in the United States. We ask that you would set your hand upon those who have served. Thank you for them, Lord, for those who have served and paid the ultimate price. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit and your comfort would be upon their family members and those who love them. God, as we cherish their memories this weekend. Lord, we thank you for that. and We thank you for them. Lord, we thank you that we have the freedom and the blessing to come and worship you. And Lord, we don't come into this place and take that for granted. We don't come to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come for entertainment or for tradition. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So it's in the name of Jesus we ask that your Holy Spirit would quicken our, our minds and our, and our hearts today to hear the word of God, that it would be a seed planted into our lives, into good ground, that we would leave this place and cultivate it, and it would grow and bear much fruit in our lives, that we could truly be the church that you have called us to be. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. These blessings we don't ask just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for them, Father. We ask in the name of Jesus that you set your hand upon all the denominations, so many of them to name, Father, that you would just be with them today on this special day, Lord. We thank you for our churches locally in this area, for the harvest and the grove and sandals and, and the well and the way. Father, we thank you for uh, Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia, for Oak Valley, Abundant Living. Father, we thank you for Crossroads and all the churches all across the Inland Empire, Lord, and around the world. Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated, grab your Bibles. Let's continue our study today. I'm excited for what the Word of God has. Man, it's some good stuff. I'm going to get right into it today so that we can get through it. It's a lot, but we're going to be good. It's going to be amazing. I know it. I, I, like Pastor Dan said, he's got to hear it twice. Me too. I'm excited for this third time. Listen, the title of this morning's message is this, The Power of a Perfect Life. The Power of a Perfect Life. Now, we've been in our study of Hebrews. We're going to talk about the power of Jesus Christ. But you know what? Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life. He, we'll see in a few moments that he perfected something that was imperfect. But also, I want to reiterate or I want to, I want to bring something to your attention that the power of a perfect life doesn't just focus in on Jesus Christ, but I want to bring the attention and I want to bring the title back to home, back to you. You see, the Bible tells us, let us move on in Hebrews 6 chapter. Let us move on towards perfection. And that God's desire, God's will, God's plan is for you and I to grow in a state of maturity or what we use as the Bible uses as the state of perfection towards Jesus Christ. So not only did Jesus through his perfect life come and perfect that which was imperfect, we'll see today, but God enabled us through that to now you and I to grow towards perfection and now you and I can leave and understand that we have power in the perfect life through Jesus Christ. It's not about us. It's not about how good we are because, hey, listen, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we can live a life towards perfection, head towards maturity and understanding of Jesus Christ. Now, we've been in Hebrews, the seventh chapter. For those of you who haven't been with us or haven't heard, I want to encourage you because I don't have a lot of time to cover it today. There were two very critical and important messages that really laid the groundwork or the foundation for what we're going to discuss today. That was two weeks ago, Pastor Deborah talking about Melchizedek and considering the man. Hebrews in the 7th chapter, verse 1 through 6. Pastor Jim last week, verse 7 through 10, uh, talking about Abraham and Melchizedek. And now today, upon that foundation, we really begin to see the power of a perfect life. So if you didn't grab a hold of those messages, go on online, listen to them. They're free online at our website, or you can grab the CD. It's, in, it's important and it's imperative that you listen or you get that into you so you understand we, how we can apply this and what it means to you and I. Today we're going to get into something pretty deep. We're going to get into some challenging and complicated word. And now I don't want that to turn you off, but here's the deal. The Bible says if anybody lacks wisdom, to let them ask him. Let's believe God today for wisdom. Secondly, in Hebrews in the sixth chapter, the Bible tells us let's leave the elementary behind and let's get into the meat. If you remember in the fifth chapter, the author of Hebrews said, you should know the complicated things, but now i got to come back and feed you milk again. Well, 
We have built the foundation of milk and cereal today. It's time to eat some New York strip or some filet mignon or something deep. We're going to chew into some meat today. So hey, listen, get ready. Get your thinking caps on. I know that when you grab a hold of this, this is the will of God for us to move towards perfection. You see, God's desire for us is to go deeper, to go greater in knowledge each and every day. And as we do so, we greatly understand even the hard things in the Word of God more clearly. So today, Hebrews in the seventh chapter, talking about the power of the perfect life, starting in verse number 11, we're going to read some of these statements. We'll stop and we'll kind of examine them and then we'll focus in on the tail end of where we're at today. Hebrews in the seventh chapter, starting in verse number 11, says, therefore, that's the, the, the introduction to the last two messages, because of the foundation that we built upon this man named Melchizedek. Now, this is a mystery. He's kind of shrouded in mystery in the Bible. He's only referred to in Genesis as well as once in the Psalms, as the psalmist is, is, is quoting. So here's this man, Melchizedek, but now the Bible tells us that Jesus comes in the order or is like Melchizedek. What does that mean? We don't know much about him. But the Bible tells us a few things, and these are the few things that we build our foundation upon. One, Melchizedek was without genealogy. The Bible doesn't tell us who his mama and dad were. His mom, Bible doesn't tell us who his lineology was. The Bible tells us, here's this guy, Melchizedek, shows up, blesses Abraham. Abraham gives a tenth of his spoils to him. That's all we know. The Bible tells us that Melchizedek was a king and priest. You see, in the olden days, it was either king or priest, but Melchizedek served both as well as he was the king of Salem or the king of peace. So now Jesus Christ is equated to this man, Melchizedek, or has come in the lineage or in the style of Melchizedek, meaning that he is both our king and our priest. He has no genealogy, no beginning, no end. Yes, he was born from Mary, but you see Jesus existed long before that because the Bible says that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus Christ comes not of man, but of God. So that's all just the therefore. Okay, here we go. We've gotten through therefore, now we go on. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under, the, under it people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You see, the author of Hebrews right here in 7th chapter, verse number 11, he's asking you and I, the church, a question. Very rarely does the Bible ask us questions because what we're trying to do, what the Word of God is trying to do is incite your thought process to get you to think about this, to get you to examine this. Why? Because it can be a difficult subject, but you and I don't have to let difficult subjects stop us from growing deeper with God. So here, they're inciting a thought. If the priesthood incited, or established by Aaron, the first priest, through the lineology or the genealogy of Levi, if the priesthood was perfect... Why did Jesus Christ have to come according to the order of Melchizedek? Why didn't he just come according to the order of Aaron? Is what he's asking. Going on in verse number 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing according to priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. So he asks us this question, if the priesthood was perfect, there's that perfect, we're going to talk about this word today, why did Jesus Christ not come according to Aaron or according to Levi. See, and the Bible tells us that he was born of the tribe of Judah. So Jesus doesn't come according to the priesthood of men or to the laws of men. The, Jesus came from a different tribe. The Bible says a tribe or a lineology that had no mention of priesthood. Now, in order to understand this, let's just dig a little bit deeper. Let's just scratch the surface a little bit. In order to be a priest before the time of Jesus Christ, you had to be born by law, it stated. You had to be born. You had to have the genealogy of the tribe of Levi. That's who were the priests. It was set and forth by Moses, the, the Mosaic law, so, so to speak. And it was from the tribe of Levi. The Levites were the priests. In order to be a priest, you were of the tribe of Levi. When you died, your son or your lineology or your next of kin took that position. It wasn't an elected position. It was an ordained position by God. 
Jesus Christ comes, and he's born of a completely different tribe or lineology from Levi. So therefore, the law would not allow Jesus to be our high priest. Therefore, verse number 12 says, the necessity that the law had to be changed. Why? Because it had to be changed to allow Jesus to be our high priest. So Jesus doesn't come like Aaron. He doesn't come like Levi. He comes from a completely different tribe, but he comes not of Judah, not just of David, but rather the power, the Bible says, of an endless life. Because, see, the laws of men said that if Jesus, if he was our new high priest and the tribe of Judah was the new representation of the priesthood, that when Jesus died, his next of kin would have been the, the priest. Well, I don't care what you believe or what else anybody's ever told you. I don't care what the Da Vinci Code says or the History Channel. They've got it all wrong. It doesn't matter. Jesus Christ has no one behind him. Why? Because he came born of a virgin unto Mary and he died with no children, no wife. He lived a spotless, sinless life. And so when Jesus died, there was nobody to take next of kin. Why? Because Jesus came with the power of an endless life. You see, after three days, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The stone was rolled away and Jesus Christ was back to life, resurrected from the dead. The Bible tells us he is our great high priest, seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I. So no longer does the, the priesthood or the representation of man to God, is it based on the lineology or the mortal flesh of man. But now we have the power of a perfect life, Jesus Christ who came, who died, who rose again, who has nobody following him. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so now we have this whole new life, this whole new law, this whole new covenant. You and I know this as the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So here the psalmist says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, the power of an endless life, no genealogy, no before, no after, king and priest at the same time. Now verse number 18, verse number 19 are really what we want to key in on. And here it says, for on the one hand, there's the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. It had to be annulled. It had to be changed because it had to allow or make way for Jesus Christ to be who he has been called to be, our king and our priest. But verse number 19 comes along and it says, For the law made nothing perfect. we got to grab a hold of that. The law made nothing perfect. There, is the be there on the other hand is the beginning of, in, of a new hope through which we draw near to God. You and I have been given a hope. I love this. I'm so blessed that I get to teach in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, all the messages on hope, talking about the full assurance of hope, talking about the anchor of our hope. Jesus Christ, now because of Jesus Christ, we have a hope. Why? Because it's not based on man. It's based on God. Jesus Christ came and he perfected that which was imperfect. The, the, the Bible tells us the law had weaknesses. Now, concerning the law, we're going to use this term. I find that there's generally three categories of Christians. There's those who are, who are uh, informed of the law. They know it or they know of it. They know some of it. They've, they've read it. They've studied it. They know some of the rituals and sacrifices. Then there are those who know of the law. Yeah, I've heard of that. Isn't that like the Ten Commandments and all those things? And then there are those who have no clue. When we talk about the law in church, there are those of us in here who think, is he talking about speeding on the freeway? Either way, we have to cover all aspects and all areas of life, whether you know the law, you know of the law, or you have no clue about the law. The question resides, what does this law that was annulled 2,000 years ago have to do with me today? Jesus Christ came and annulled it. Jesus Christ came and changed it. Jesus Christ came and redid it. But that was 2,000 years ago. Why do I need to know what happened that was outdated 2,000 years ago? Why do I need to know that today? And the simple spiritual truth is this. Very simply put, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. We cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, the Bible tells us that we are no longer under the law, but we cannot get rid of it. Why? Because the law established God's moral standards for mankind. You see, it was out of necessity that God made the law. One of the questions that always arises in Christianity is, why did God make something, like the Bible says, that was weak and unprofitable? Because God needed to point men to the reality that they were imperfect, that they had a sin nature, and he needed to bring men to the point that 
that they realized that they could not do this on their own. So we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. Otherwise, we go onto the other side of the road from legalism in one ditch to the complete opposite to we go to liberalism and we live life however we want, doing whatever we want, thinking however we want. But God clearly tells us we can't do that. So we think, well, what does that mean? Well, Romans, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans. We're going to kind of be in Romans in the 7th and 8th chapter today, reading about Paul the Apostle as he's talking to the church in Rome, some educated Jews uh, who are acquainted with the law. And as you're turning there, I'm just going to read a statement to you out of Romans, the 7th chapter, out of the New Living Translation. Romans, the 7th chapter, the previous verses leading up to verse number 11, Paul the Apostle says that the law showed us or brought us to sin. It showed us our sin, but sin exploited our awareness of it. Paul the Apostle goes on to say, he says, listen, I didn't know that I'm not supposed to covet something until the law came and told me, thou shalt not covet. Hey, you may not have known that it's not okay to murder until you heard in the law, thou shalt not kill. See, the law brought us to the awareness, okay, now all of a sudden we know we can't do this, but now sin, Paul says, steps in and took advantage of that, exploited our awareness, and created evil within us to the law. So now we as humans look at the law because of our nature. We say, oh, no, that's bad. But look what Paul the Apostle says about this law, whether you know it or you don't know it. Look what he says about it. Verse number 11, sin took advantage of those commands. Romans, the seventh chapter. Sick took advantage of those commands, and it deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy. Its commandments are holy and right and good. You see, the law is holy, right, and good. Regardless if we know it, regardless if we study it, regardless if we believe it or not, Paul the Apostle, you realize that Paul wrote this after Jesus Christ came, died, and resurrected. Paul the Apostle writes about the law that it is holy, good, and right. So we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's human nature for sin to come in and exploit that which we can and cannot do. It's like this. If I told you for the rest of the day, hey, listen, don't do this. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a not to. Okay, I'm going to give you thou shalt not. All right? Tell me. I'm going to do a little experiment. Thou shalt not. Do not for the rest of the day because your, your life depends on it if I told you this. Don't think of, don't imagine in any form or fashion a big, black, hairy gorilla in the jungle. Don't do it. Don't think about it. Don't imagine it. Don't even picture it. Don't even let your imagination go there. Half of you in this place, the moment I said, don't do it, you thought about it. That's human nature. That's the sin nature. When sin comes and says, or the law says, don't do it, the sin nature came in and said, well, now that it says don't, now that you're aware of it, I'm going to exploit it and bring you to it. But Jesus Christ came and perfected it. You see, the former priesthood brought nothing to perfection. We read that. It couldn't justify men from guilt. It couldn't sanctify us from our inward pollution or cleanse our consciousness from dead works. All the old priesthood and the old Mosaic law could do was lead us to Jesus Christ, who would come and perfect it. The law was holy, just, and good. It showed the sinfulness of sin, and it served, Paul the Apostle refers to it in Galatians as our schoolmaster or our tutor, which points us in the direction and, re and, re and reveals Jesus Christ to us. The law is useful to you and I. Oftentimes we ask this question, or we get asked this question, why is it that God decided to make something that was imperfect? Why did God establish a law that he knew wouldn't work? Why did he, why, sometimes we get this, people, people's oftentimes their challenge with Christianity is, why is the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament? But let me present this thought to you. You see, the Old Testament law tells of the forest by speaking of or describing the trees. But God in the New Testament tells of the trees by speaking of the forest. You see, it's still the same trees. It's still the same forest. It's still the same God. But God presented the law. He knew it. It wasn't a permanent plan when he established it because he knew that it would bring men to the realization that they could not do things on their own and then they needed to look towards Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible tells us that when the fullness of time had come, Jesus Christ came, born of a woman, born of a virgin. When God's plan had been fulfilled, now it was time 
for the answer, the permanent, the perfect solution to be presented. Law was based out of necessity. It started out with Ten Commandments, and then it grew and it grew and it grew as men fell away from God, as men fell into their own kind. It grew, much like as if you and I today in our society look at our own law. Fifty years ago, you look back at law, and there weren't as many laws as there are today. Why? Because as necessity arises, we create that rule. Hey, somebody drove too fast on a road at some point, and somebody got together and said, listen, we should establish speed limits for roads. Somebody took a bomb or a weapon on a plane and at some point people got together and said hey we should make a law that you can't bring weapons on planes because of the necessity so as time progressed and progressed and progressed the law and the bondage of the law grew to the point where the, the law held men away from God it kept them buried in their burdens why so that they would realize that they needed something greater than just rules and regulations the law was based on the outward appearance, but the New Covenant, the New Testament through Jesus Christ is based on the inward. That's why Jesus Christ said, you have heard it said in the Beatitudes. He says, you've heard it said, do not uh, commit adultery. And Jesus goes on to say, if you stay on the outside, the law says on the outward appearance, you look like you think you're okay. But Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart or your eyes, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Why? Because the law is not now based on the outside. It's not about how good we are on the outside. Now it's based on the inside through Jesus Christ because it has been perfected. Now, what does all this have to do with me, Pastor Luke? I have no clue what the law is. I have no clue what the Bible says. Simply put, let me tell you what the law is. Do you want to know? Do you want to know easily? Today, you can know the whole law. Today, the one thing, the law is simply fulfilled with love. That's it. You want to know thou shalt, thou shalt not? The law is simply fulfilled by love. As a matter of fact, Jesus, as he's questioned, tested rather by a, a leader. They say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? What is the greatest commandment in the Word of God? Jesus' response to them is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Verse number 38, this is the first and the great commandment. Secondly, he goes on to say the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse number 40 comes along and says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It's not about the thou shalt and the thou shalt not. You see, we get so stuck on what we can and cannot do. When Jesus comes and says the perfected law, the perfected priesthood of Jesus Christ, the order of a power of a perfect life comes and says, it's not about what you can and what you can't do. It's about what's on the inside of you. And when you have a love for God so much, so you'll look at the things that the law says thou shalt not do, and you'll say, you know what? I love God so much that I'm going to walk away from I'm going to turn away from I'm not going to do the things that oppose God. And on the other side of the coin, you love people so much because God has commended you to love people that you say, hey, I love my neighbor. I may not like him, but I love him enough to not kill him. Praise God. <laughs> to not steal from him. To not covet from them. To not be jealous. And in doing so, we fulfill the law. You don't have to know the commandments. You don't have to know the dates. That's where the annulling comes from. But what you do have to do is love God and love people. And in doing so, like Romans the 13th chapter says, love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore it fulfills the law. The law is completely summed up to you and I in our day and age, 2,000 years later, simply in this, by loving God and by loving people. It's that easy. It's that easy. That's the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ made it simple for us to understand. Today, I want to say a statement. We're going to look at this. How does this affect me? How does this empower me? Because of this, there's some things, some understandings that you and I need to grab a hold of so that we can live life towards perfection, so that we can grow into maturity, so that we can be effective in our walks with God. So we're going to see some things about this. Because Jesus perfected what was imperfect, we're going to look at some freedoms, some liberties that we have today based on the old. Because Jesus perfected what was imperfect, number one, we are free from sin. Praise God. Did I say we're not going to sin? No. I said we're free from it. We're free from the bondage of sin and death. We no longer have to be slaves to the sin nature of who we once were. The Bible tells us that we were crucified in Christ and live again. You see, you and I no longer have to be in bondage to the nature of sin that we once were. See, I had you turn into Romans in the 7th chapter. I'm going to read again in Romans in the 7th chapter. Verse number 24. 
Verse number 23, Paul says, I've noticed there's a battle between my mind and, and sin. I want to do the things of God, but my body just makes mistakes. Verse number 24, he comes on to say, oh, what a miserable person I am. The New King James Bible says, oh, what a wretched man I am. You know what? I know that when you have made a mistake, you look in the mirror. I know for me, when I've made a mistake, I look in the mirror and I say, God, what a wretched person I am. But here, Paul the Apostle, will find some comfort. Paul the Apostle, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, is telling you and I, the church, hey, I make mistakes also. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? The answer comes in the next verse. Oh, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. I do. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. But did you know that when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he didn't write it chapter and verse? He didn't stop there. That wasn't the end of the thought. Look at Romans, the eighth chapter, verse number one says. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse number two comes on to say, For the law of the Spirit in Christ is life, and Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. You see, no longer are we bound by sin and death. We come into this place and we say, oh, well, Jesus taught us some good words. Jesus taught us some good precepts. Let me, let me tell you something. This message is never about a self-help. This message is never about a life betterment. This message is never about you and I coming and listening to some good thoughts, some good things, and if we apply them, we'll be better off. It's not about that. It's about Jesus' help. It's about Jesus' betterment. It's all about Jesus. And because of Jesus, who perfected that which was imperfect, get it, get it, get it, because Jesus perfected that which was imperfect, you and I are no longer bound to the sin of, of, of death. We are no longer bound to the slavery of our sin nature because we have been released. We have been free from that because of our high priest and king, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Talking about because Jesus perfected that which was imperfect. Number two, you and I, we're free from inner turmoil. We're free from inner turmoil. We're free from guilt. Like Paul said, what a wretched man I am. We carry this weight and this, and this bondage of sin and this, 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 this heaviness of our decisions. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to make uh, uh, wrong choices in life. But thank God Jesus Christ has come and he bore the weight of our sin and shame so that you and I no longer have to. That's why Jesus says, come to me, you who are heavy laden. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why? Because it's not God's design for you and I to carry the weight of our sin sin in our shame. That's why Jesus Christ went to the cross to carry it on his shoulders. We no longer have to live a life of despair because now we are free from inner turmoil. Romans, we just read it in the first verse, eighth chapter. There's no condemnation in Christ. John the third chapter. We know John 3.16, John 3.17. Jesus Christ didn't come in this world to condemn it, but to save it. Jesus Christ didn't come to condemn us, but to redeem us. We no longer have to transfer our sins symbolically to an animal, to a sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus Christ came the final, became the final sacrifice for you and I and carried our sin as far as east is from west. No longer are we attached to it, but now it has been removed from us because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the perfected law. <laughs> Romans in the 8th chapter, verse number 5. Romans in the 8th chapter, verse number 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds... On the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, their minds on the things of the Spirit. Verse number six. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because when you and I grab a hold of what Jesus Christ has perfected, and we no longer live in the old, we no longer live in the weakness or the unprofitable, but now we live in the perfected, through Jesus Christ, you and I can be spiritually minded. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to mess up. Yes, we're going to make bad decisions, but we don't have to live in the weight, in the burden, in the bondage of those sins anymore. Hey, now we don't have to stay in it because Jesus Christ has given us the ability to get out of it. We are free to inner peace. Free from guilt. Praise God. Because Jesus Christ perfected that which was imperfect. Number three, we are free to draw close to God. 
We are free to draw close to God. You see, the old covenant, the old law kept men at distance from God. You could not enter the presence of God with sin in your life. You would die. But now, because Jesus Christ has perfected that which is imperfect, you and I are free to enter into the presence of God. Even more so than free to enter into the presence of God, you and I have the very presence of God dwelling on the inside of us. We have access to God everywhere, every time. doesn't matter. We don't have to go to a special building. We don't have to go to a special person. Why? Because we've got God Almighty on the inside of us. God has removed the veil that kept us from Him, and now we have God inside of us. Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans, the 8th chapter. We're there again. Let's look at verse number 9 now. Romans, the 8th chapter, verse number 9. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now listen, you got to stop. If you've got a pen, if you've got a marker, if you've got a highlighter, girls, if you've got eyeliner or lipstick, whatever you got, you ought to take it out and circle that word dwells in us. Because here the Bible is telling you and I that the Spirit of God Himself through the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. We are no longer separated from God. He is no longer veiled or hidden from our presence, but now God is actually on the inside of us, living in us, creating life inside of us. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, obviously he's not Him. God's not in you if you're not in Christ. Verse number 10 goes on to say, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness, because of right standing with God, because Jesus Christ removed the distance from God and man and became the bridge to connect us once again together. You and I can come into a covenant and a communion relationship with God, and because so we can live in righteousness or right standing with God. And now we have God on the inside of us. I love how Romans in the 8th chapter, the 31st verse tells us, hey, if God is for us, who could be against us? Listen to this. Where darkness exists, this is physically impossible. Where darkness exists, light, or where light exists, darkness cannot exist. You could go to the deepest, darkest cave in the world and you turn on a flashlight and the instant light becomes active, darkness no longer occupies that space. How about this? If the Bible says God before us, who could be against us? How about this? God inside of us, who could be against us? Where God exists, darkness cannot. You and I are free to live a life of righteousness and right standing with God because he dwells inside of us and removes that which is dark on the inside of us. Whoa! Whoa! Remember we talked about the law could not justify men. It could not cleanse men. It could not redeem men. But now you have been so justified. You have been so cleansed. You have been so redeemed that God himself is inside of you through his Holy Spirit. What, is, what a precious and terrifying gift that is that we carry the presence of God. Talk about the fear of God and that you and I are the temple of God. Everywhere we go, everything we do, God is there not just watching in us, what an amazing thought. Last one for today. Can you handle one more today? Can we handle one more? All right. Because Jesus perfected that which was imperfect, number four, we are free to life. We are free to life. We have got to gain an understanding of what life is. You see, the Bible told us, we just read this, for to be carnally minded is death. When we define life as the world defines it. Hey, you've heard the statement. Hey, man, you're living the life. We think of life in our day and age. We think of blessing in our day and age as materialist things. We think of a life as, oh man, you're living a life if you got money, you got cars, you got stature, you got homes, you got clothes, you got identity, you got people look at you and say, man, that guy's really living it up. But when we define life based on the things of the world, the Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We have got to get a grip and an understanding of what life is as the Bible defines it. Life is not about material. Life is not about money. It is not about image. It is not about houses or cars. It's not about whether we live long or we live short. It's not about whether we live healthy or we live sick. That's all separate to life. Why? Because life is God inside of us. That's why Apostle Paul 
Paul said, I have learned to be content whether I'm broke or I'm rich, whether I'm hungry or I'm full, whether it's cloudy or it's raining. Why? Because life isn't based on circumstances. Life is based on God. And because of Jesus Christ, he perfected that which is imperfect. You and I don't base our life. We're living the life, but not like the world says. Yeah, you know what? We can be blessed in the material. We can be blessed in our health. We can be blessed in everything that we put our hands to. But on the same time, we're not defined by that. And when we don't have it, we don't say we're not living the life. Why? Because we've got life inside of us. Life inside of us. We don't have to live busted. We don't have to live down and depressed and in the dumps. Romans in the 8th chapter, verse number 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. There it is again. You got to highlight that again. Girls, get out that eyeliner. <laughs> he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Jesus said he came to give us life and more abundant. We have a life. You can go and minister the gospel. You can go witness to somebody. You can go smile. You can throw that bumper sticker on the back of your car and somebody will drive by and tell you, hey, man, get a life. You can say, hey, I got one. Because it's not about the world's definition of life. That's death. It's about God's definition of life. Jesus Christ and the power inside of us. The law was based on the outside, based on the external, based on you. If you thought you could do everything good, you thought you could do everything right, as long as you looked good on the outside, you thought so, but it never justified. It never redeemed. It never cleansed. It was all based on ritual. But now the new covenant through Jesus Christ perfected is based on the inside, which cleanses us from the inside out. So, hey, the outside reflects the in. We now have life. When we have life on the inside, guess what? We will have life on the outside. It's a simple principle. I love this one. Let's conclude with this thought today in Galatians in the second chapter. I'll just put it up on the overheads for you. Galatians in the second chapter, verse number 19, Paul the Apostle says, So, for through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. Verse number 20 goes on to say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that I live, it's no longer me. You see, it's no longer Luke Cobre. It's no longer you who are alive. It's Jesus Christ who is living through you. You're dead. You died to sin. The old person who you once were is gone in Christ Jesus. And now it is Jesus who lives through you. And because we have the life, not just the life of somebody who was good, Life of God inside of us, we have a life. Look how many times he says, life, live, life, live, life, live. Why? Because Jesus Christ came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Jesus Christ perfected that which was imperfect, the law. God knew all along that it would point men to Jesus so that when the time came and he came, we would grab a hold of it, apply it, and live it. It doesn't matter how much you know or how little you know. If you take away anything from this, when we talk about the subject of the law, Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle, teaches us that to fulfill the law, we need to love God and love people. The law is fulfilled by love. Why? Because Jesus Christ was the perfect example of love. He went ahead of us and did it. He didn't just tell us. He lived it. And because he lived it, we live a life of love. We fulfill the law in all of its goodness, all of its righteousness, and all of its justness. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't worry about what side of the road we're on or what ditch we're in. We go down the straight and narrow, that narrow path to heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ perfected that which was imperfect. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. Listen, there's so much going on. Thank you guys. For those of you who remain seated, I appreciate that. Girls, don't forget. Girls' night out. Tickets are available. Go ahead and grab one of those. Don't, don't procrastinate. Uh, they sell them by seat and, and ordered seating. So if you want to get a group of people together, get, get, on, get on board of that. You can skip the lines. Let me just give you a little bit of word of advice. There's going to be a line no matter what at today at the tent right afterwards. You can skip that line by going on womenrock.us.us and you can buy tickets online. And you can pick your seat and everything. It's a really cool program developed in-house for you guys. So I encourage you to do that. Guys, if you're buying tickets for your girls, don't be like me and wait till the last minute until it's too late. Get out there and do it right now so that way you get your girls a good seat. Hey, listen, thank you guys so much for everything today. I appreciate you guys coming and hearing the word of God. But I want to do one more thing. I want to just ask, just give me a couple more moments of your attention. Let me ask you a very important question. You see, 
it would be a travesty for us to get together to worship God, to hear about the Word of God, and to not give each and every one of us an opportunity in this place to examine our hearts, to examine our lives, to see where it is we stand with God in our eternal relationship with God. So I want to ask this question. Nobody's going to know the answer except you and God, and I want you to answer it in your heart and honestly. If you were to leave today and die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you think you're going to get to heaven, because you want to get to heaven, because you hope so, that you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to get to heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Hey, did you know that you can't get to heaven because you sit in church, because you carry your Bible, because you volunteer or sing in the choir or carry the pastor's Bible? You can't get to heaven that way. You see, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person. We believe so much in America that if I do good things, if I give to charitable organizations, if I wear the shoes that put shoes on other people's feet around the world, if I don't cheat on my taxes, if I do more good in my life than bad, then I'm going to go to heaven. But did you see that nowhere? Do you realize that nowhere, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do would ever be good enough. Why? Because it's not about the outward. We talked about that. Nothing we can do on the outside makes us good enough to get to heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day, a man by the name of Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. As they were discussing the subject of eternal life, Jesus gives John, or gives Nicodemus, excuse me, the answer to how we get there. You see, Nicodemus was a religious leader. He taught in the synagogue or the church of his time. Nicodemus had memorized the scripture. He wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things. Fed the poor, gave. You would think that Jesus would pat him on the back, but he says to him, you must be born again. There it is. Our society has made a mockery or joke out of that term. You think of born again, you think of, oh man, radical, weirdo, crazy, out of control Christians. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in God's eyes, in God's heart, born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your life. You've given God all of your heart. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not about your mental ascent towards God. It's not about your carnal knowledge of who God is. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus Christ is. The Bible tells us that the devil himself was able to quote scriptures to Jesus, so it's not about you memorizing verses. It's not about you sitting in church. It's not about you knowing who God is. It's about you giving Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. Let me prove it to you in the Word of God. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ himself is speaking to the church, and he says to you and I, people of the church, he says, I'm coming back. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa, that's a shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's dissect that meaning. Lukewarm means in terms of your relationship with God that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down, occasional church attendance, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. In and out, in and out, in and out. Token prayer every once and again. Not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of running from God instead of to God. We even say it like this. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And if that's you living a life lukewarm, let me love you enough, let me respect you enough to tell you the truth that you're just not going to make it. I'm sorry to tell you. I, 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 I hope that that doesn't, you think any less of me of that, but honestly it doesn't matter how you feel about me. That's the truth of the word of God. And I love you enough, I respect you enough to not beat around the bush and tell you the truth. You're not going to make it to heaven because you think so. You're not going to go to heaven because you want to. You're not going to go to heaven because you sit in church. You're not going to go to heaven because you know who Jesus is. You're not going to go to heaven because you think you're a Christian. The only way we can get there is God's way. Oftentimes as Christians we think or as people we think, oh, well, you get there your way, we'll get there my way, we'll all get there the same. You know, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. I'm sorry. No matter which way you drive out of this campus, no matter which direction or how high you get, you'll never drive to the moon. Why? Because no, no, no roads lead to the moon. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way, some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one Listen, no one goes to the Father except through Him. So let's not do it any other way but God's. Today, in just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with heaven. Maybe you're not sure. Today, I want to give you that opportunity in just a few moments to make sure today. Here's what I'm going to do. Jesus Christ said that if you confess Him before men, He will confess you before His Father. If you deny Him before men, He will deny you before His Father. So simply put, here's what I'm going to do. And in just a few moments, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible real loud like that. And on that smack, on that bang, 
I want to give you the opportunity to be bold. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to go to heaven. I want to make sure today that I get into heaven. I want to give Jesus Christ my heart. I want to give him all my life. I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. You say, you know what, Pastor Luke, I don't think I can do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. You know what? You might be embarrassed. But let me encourage you. Why don't you shed that moment of embarrassment? How about this? Don't be embarrassed. Why? Because this is a special moment for you. Don't be embarrassed today. This is the moment of your salvation. Don't walk away because of a human emotion that's going to last a moment. Don't forego eternity because you couldn't make a decision for a moment. The decision's yours. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. God already did everything he could. You need to understand this. To ensure you get to heaven and leaving hell behind by giving for you Jesus Christ to die on the cross. A beaten, bloody mess to hang a spectacle naked for the world to see. And in return, he wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. It's your choice, your free will choice. Who should raise their hands? If you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life. In just a moment, if that's you, when I count to three, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you're not sure. Hey, today, make sure. Don't walk out of here without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you just can't afford to make. Maybe you did this at a Harvest or a Billy Graham Crusade or on television, but you never really followed through with it today. Let's make this the day you go forward and follow through with your relationship with Jesus Christ. And finally, who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? If you've been running from God instead of to God, today let's make this the day that you ensure your place in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever leaving hell behind. You might even say, Pastor Luke, I don't know about heaven or hell. I don't even think they exist. Listen, let me tell you something. Just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not real. It's real enough for God to speak about it. It's real enough for the Bible to preserve it over thousands of years. It's real enough for Jesus Christ himself to talk about it. Therefore, it's real enough, regardless of whether we see it, feel it or not, it's real enough for you and I to take it serious. The decision is yours. So in a moment, from the front to the back, whether you're in the family rooms, if you're in the Love Rock Cafe, or you're in the, alt, or in the foyer watching by television, or at home, online, wherever you're at, in just a moment, the opportunity is going to come. And I want to encourage you, Shed that moment and let's go forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's make sure today you spend eternity with God and you live the life we talked about today. The decision is yours. I'm going to count to three from the front to the back, side to side, wherever you're at, watching on the television or by online, wherever you're at, today is your day. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready. When I count to three, get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll go forward from there. Here we go. Ready? One, two, Three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you right there. One, two, three, four. I see you. Keep your hand up so I can see it. Four wise people. Where are you at in this place today? See hands pointing over here? Where's that? Give me a little wave so I can see it. I want to I wanna see that hand. Let me see that hand. I see ushers pointing. I don't, oh, I see you right there. Five. All right. Six. I got you right there. Six wise people. Seven in the back. I see you. Where are you at today? See, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. This is you. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God. It's not about men. It's not about me. It's about God. Don't start the few moments off of your life in rebellion by not answering God. I see hands pointing over in this direction. Where are you at? Eight. Where, oh, eight. I got you right there. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? You say, man, I wonder if I should. God's speaking to you right now. Don't ignore God. If that's you in this place today, eight wise people, where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? You say, I wonder if I should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time. Where are you at today? Anybody else in this place today? I'm going to close it up. I'm going to finish this off right now. Eight wise people. Anybody else? Well, praise God for eight wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do in just a moment. Elijah's going to sing a song. We're going to all get up. If you raise your hand, or listen, for the double of you, number 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you didn't raise your hand. God's speaking to you right now. It's not about me. It's about you and God. In a moment, if it's important enough for you to raise your hand, it's important enough for you to follow through. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. And we want to pray with you. We want to get some information. We want to help you. We want to change destinies with you together. So in a moment, we're all going to stand. And as Elijah sings a song, if that's you who raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. Grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend if you need a friend. Hey, if you came with somebody or you brought, or somebody brought you, or you brought somebody. Look at them and say, hey, I'll go with you or come with me. Get out of your seat and get out of your chair and come meet me here at this altar. And let's change destinies together. So let's all stand together. Please, nobody leave at this time. And if that's you, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand from the front to the back, come on and let's change destinies together. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, you come. I give you my this is your time. Too late. Lord, I Make that choice.
Hallelujah. Hey, listen, guys. Did you know something? I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is a day to celebrate. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Good stuff. Cool? Here's what we're going to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This guy right over here waving at you in that really cool white jacket. That's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Oh, I promise I am as weird as it gets. And you got through me. What he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. He's going to lead you in a real easy prayer, okay? You got to mean it from the heart. It's not about your words. It's about your heart. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some literature. You're going to walk out of this place today and say, what do I do? I don't know where to go from now on. The literature is going to help you. Really easy reading just to help you get founded in the Word of God. The third thing he's going to do is we're going to give you a friend. We give away friends at the Rock Church Home Without Center. We call them spiritual personal trainers, SPTs. You know, you go to the gym, you get a, spirit, or a personal trainer, they make sure you don't waste your time on that equipment you have no clue how to use so you get strong. Well, we've got spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you before church, they'll buy you a cup of coffee for five weeks, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the things of God so that you don't go back to the life that you came from. And the one last thing I want to say to you is, listen, God spoke to you here. That's why you're here. It's not about me. It's about God. I want to challenge you. To come to the house of God, to the Rock Church and Wilder Center, where God spoke to you for the next 12 months. I'm not asking you to join a cult or anything like that. I'm asking you to come and sit and hear the word of God and get it in your heart. And I promise after a year, you will be so blessed in your life, you will not even question the decisions you've made. You will never look back on where you came from. But you've got to follow through with it. Don't leave today without making that wholehearted commitment. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent Him for me, and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.